So today we have the pleasure of having Summer Rankin, Lead Associate Data Scientist from the Strategic Innovation Group at Booz Allen, join us to talk about her experience as a woman in technology. Hi, Summer. Summer has a PhD in complex systems and brain sciences and brings with her expertise in deep learning, natural language processing, anomaly detection, and performance measurement to projects within one of the world's leading consulting firms. So without further ado, let's dive into our session with uh, Summer today. Hey, Summer, thanks for joining us. Hey, pleasure to be here. So, um, you know, your bio is just um, very intimidating, like half the words I have no idea what they mean. So we'll go into that later. Um, I want you to explain a little bit to our audience, you know, what you actually do. So, you know, in our last session when we chatted, um, you know, you're, you're not from Hawaii, I'm not from Hawaii. So it's always interesting to know what brought you here. So maybe you, we can just start the session by having you share, you know, what brought you to Hawaii. Yeah, so um, my company, Booz Allen Hamilton, actually um, brought me out here uh, to Hawaii. Yeah, so how, you know, uh, how did you stumble about upon that opportunity? Did you start with Booz Allen here in Hawaii or was it from somewhere else and then transferred over? No, actually, so I worked, um, so I've been with Booz Allen for about three years now, and I started in, I used to live in Baltimore, and I was working with um, a bunch of our, like, D.C. area clients, so, um, you know, that's like D.C., Virginia, Baltimore, sort of Maryland, they call it the DMV, um, mm -hmm. and so I was working up there with, uh, with, that's kind of the actually like the hub for Booz Allen. So that's like the majority of our employees as well as our business um, because we do mostly government contracting. And so I worked there for about two years and then, you know, they said, uh, you know, we're looking to increase our, um, you know, AI capabilities in the pack rim. And I was like, I'm your girl. You definitely want me to go do that. And uh, after, you know, uh, several months of, of trying to convince people, um, they they uh, agreed and, and were happy to send me out here. So that was basically how it went. Um, mm -hmm. And I've been here since right before the pandemic. I literally moved here February of 2020. Um, and uh, so, yeah, but, I, you know, regardless, of, I've been having a great time and, and a great experience and I, I couldn't be happier. I, I really love it here and I, I can't wait to, to experience non-pandemic Hawaii. Yeah, I know. Welcome, uh, even though it's been slightly more than a year. So, you know, I think, yeah. if, you know, like most of us, we have been stuck at home, you know, because of the pandemic. And you probably never really had the opportunity to go into the office either since you are you were new to the island um, you know, coming in, right? Yeah, like three times, literally, about three times I went into the to our local office, but we do have one. Um, it is in Honolulu, downtown Honolulu on Bishop Street. Um, it's a really great space. They, you know, uh, they have like a really cool sort of open plan office and uh, they actually just re renovated a bunch of it during um I, I guess they've been doing it during the pandemic. Um, but uh, yeah, so a lot of us, I haven't seen anyone physically, uh, even though we talk on video a lot. So I haven't seen anyone physically in my office for a long time. Mm -hmm. So you haven't really changed for you, I guess, right? Since you have only been into the office like three times, you know, since um, the pandemic started, right? It's almost mostly working from home until now. Yeah, so, um, but it did change for me. Like my work has has completely shifted to, to PacRim. Oh, okay. So were you working on other projects outside of Hawaii before that or? Absolutely. Yeah, I was working pretty much um, on projects that were local to the, the DMV area, right? So mm -hmm. Rockville, Maryland and downtown DC and places like that. I did work remotely a lot even up there just because a lot of what I do as a data scientist can be done remotely. But um, you know, so a, a lot of that basically shifted over to doing work, even though it's still remote, I'm now doing work for our PacRim clients. Oh, cool. So um, what is, okay, so for Booz Allen, it's interesting you mentioned that, you know, has there always been, um, you know, a culture of remote working over at Booz or, yeah? Yeah, so I will say, I mean, it does depend a lot on who the client is, uh, and, and it tends to, that's kind of true for Booz Allen in, in general, and any consulting firm, really, like it, it's very, 
what you do is very dependent on what the, who the client is and what they want and kind of what our role is for that client, right? So, for example, um, sometimes we work really closely, like hand in hand with our clients and we're literally on site with them every day. And there's like very little difference between the government employees and the Booz Allen employees. We just work kind of seamlessly together. Um, and so in a way, we're almost like supplementing their their staff. Um, and that happens here, that happens in DC. There's a lot of places. And so in those cases, um, especially depending on whether or not you need to be doing things that are um, classified, you're not going to be able to do any of that from your home, right? That's a that's a, a problem. So um, it depends a lot on the contract. But for contracts where, you know, you're looking at unclassified data, um, especially for those of us that do a lot of coding and programming, there's, um, you know, there's really a lot of, of remote work and a lot of, even when you're, you're close by in DC, sometimes it like takes you a long time to get from A to B. So, you know, people just jump on a WebEx or a phone call or a, WebEx is like the corporate Zoom, if you will. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so there's, and it's actually one of the huge things that even before the pandemic, you know, I felt like, I always felt like Booz Allen did a really good job of it. And it was funny because when I was at my orientation, when I first started working for Booz, a lot of the women I was sitting at the table with, they weren't data scientists and they were sort of saying like, yeah, the remote work and the flex work that we get at Buzellen is like a big reason why I want to work here. And I was like, you know, that actually does go a long way to like helping to gain some parity and some equity, um, you know, offering remote work mm -hmm. because so many women end up being caregivers and caretakers and we need that flexibility. And so I've always kind of thought that, it's always just been an interesting thing I've noted about sort of Booz Allen's ability to attract um, for, you know, a more diverse crowd than some of the other consulting firms. Yeah, interesting. And, um, you know, that you mentioned that, are there any other forms of support that, you know, Booz gives to female employees, you know, other than the whole flexible working, remote working culture? Yeah. Yeah, so they have um, a strong paternity and maternity leave uh, that, you know, that they encourage people to take. And, you know, another thing I really like, I, I promise I'm not here as like an advertisement for Booth Allen. Yeah, <laughs> but, no, it's um, not. <laughs> <laughs> this is already Booth Allen's like. Um, so another thing I like is uh, that they, you know, people treat, uh, so my background is academia and, there's kind of no such thing as vacation in academia. And so coming from academia to um, to this sort of corporate slash government contracting world has been, that's been the biggest change for me. That and like the keeping track of like exact hours is very different. Um, but vacation, people treat that sacred. Like nobody tells you you can't take it. Nobody questions it when you take it and people don't bother you when you take it. And I think that that is really um, important to everyone, to be honest, like that's not like only important to women, but I think that, um, you know, we tend to uh, get get penalized more sometimes for like things like maternity leave. And, mm -hmm. and I also like that they do encourage the paternity leave because part of getting equity and part of getting women to not be penalized for things like that is having men also taking it and making that regular. And I see a lot of that happen and mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's encouraged and respected. And that's something I like a lot. Wow. That's great. And it's good to know. Yeah. I've been seeing a lot of, you know, emails coming in as well from male colleagues or male, like people I work with in other companies saying like, oh, I'm on paternity leave to whenever. Right. And, you know, I try to respect that and not reach out. I'm like, okay, you know, we can touch base later kind of thing. So let's backtrack a little Absolutely. bit. Um, tell sure. us about your role at Booz Allen. You know, if you can share what you're working on these days, because I know you work on a lot of, you know, highly classified projects, but whatever you can share. And of course, you know, <laughs> touch on what Project Shakespeare is, because that's also, you know, something that sounds really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. So I am a uh, lead data scientist or a senior data scientist at, at Booz Allen, and my day consists of um, actually a pretty wide variety of things. And I would actually say that that's true of most data scientists. Um, so me specifically, you know, I go from, you know, building a model using a GPU and optimizing it for, you know, a healthcare client to detect, um, you know, 
mortality and kidney disease to, um, you know, maybe to, to like building a large, leading a large project. Uh, well, to me, it's large leading like 10 different developers and data scientists on a project where we're building an entire tool for a client that's going to then live in the cloud and they're going to use it and deploy it. And it's going to be sort of part of their um, toolkit. Right. And so it, it, that involves data science, but there's also a lot of like management and, um, even sometimes kind of like marketing, if you will, um, because if, if somebody wants to do AI or do data science, then, you know, sometimes I'll go and I'll talk to a client and say, here's what we did that was similar. Here's what might work for you. And here's just what it is in general, right? Because not everybody is going to be some kind of expert in, in deep learning or even, you know, advanced statistics. So um, mm -hmm. I try to kind of bridge that gap between you know, trying to understand what, what people need and what we can offer them. So it's a, it's a variety of things. Mm -hmm. So what is Project Shakespeare? So, sorry, did my camera just go out? Uh, I can see you, but I think, um, yeah, the, the okay. internet might be, the connection might be a little spotty. Okay, it was spinning, sorry. Um, so Project Shakespeare is uh, sort of a, a carryover from my, my Maryland uh, days. Um, it's a project that I worked on with the um, Food and Drug Administration. And so it was uh, myself and a few other data scientists. We worked together, um, you know, essentially kind of hand in hand with the um, Rosalie Bright, who is an epidemiologist at um, the FDA. So she had this vision of building, uh, you know, building a model to detect adverse Adverse events only based on the text, uh, if you will, like the notes portion of medical records. And so she had gotten inspired by this because she saw that someone had done natural language processing, which is essentially just data science with language and text um, on the works of Shakespeare to kind of try and figure out, you know, who the author was or who, which play it was and, and had done some analysis on that. And so that inspired her and she thought like, ah, I'm gonna start this, this project. So she called it, she coined the, the term Project Shakespeare. And uh, we worked on that project for about three years and essentially looked at this uh, public uh, sort of well-known medical data set from uh, a Boston, a group of hospitals in Boston called the Mimic data set. And uh, we, we looked at that and we basically sort of didn't look at any of the like structured data. So no heart rate, no, none of that like lab value kind of stuff. We just looked at the notes portion. We took those in and we essentially kind of separated the patients into um, people who had received a blood transfusion and then people who had not to detect adverse events following blood transfusion. And so that was kind of the first use case that we did. And we tried a lot, we did a lot of exploration and it was a lot of fun because it actually reminded me of being in an academic lab again, uh, because you know we, we went about it in a very systematic way and we did some, some supervised methods, some unsupervised methods and you know ended up landing on essentially an ensemble of techniques that we used to pull out people who had experienced an adverse event, but the doctor, so the idea is the clinician doesn't always know, right, that there's an adverse event because sometimes the FDA doesn't even know about it until it's happened, right, until after it's kind of happened and they've gone, oh, and when this is a real use case, right? So this use case is, you know, the, the transfusions um, were causing were being done too often and kind of causing these adverse events. And so the FDA actually revised their guidance on who gets a transfusion and when based on this. But her idea was like, let's do this historical look back to see if we can pull those out without having a clinician write adverse event, right? That's mm -hmm. easy to look for. Mm -hmm. So it's like, how do we detect these, if you will, outliers? And so we um, developed a method, which we call the Shakespeare method. And we're actually in the progress and the process of publishing uh, a couple of different papers on it right now, which is um, really exciting. That's it wasn't really uh, part of the plan, but it sort of came it sort of fell out of it. And, and it was something Rosalie wanted to do. And so we've been happy to, to support that as well. Sure. Were there any were there any major findings from that or any? you know, things that- Yeah, so we, 
Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, not necessarily applied. It's not really like a tool that's ready to go necessarily. It's more of like the beginning, like most research, it's like a brick in this wall, right? Like it's a step and someone can take it and and take it to the next step. But it's essentially something, a technique that could certainly assist epidemiologists in finding these adverse events among a group of patients. We actually did a second use case with uh, heparin contamination, and we were able to pull out in both cases um, documents or patients that had experienced some adverse events in these in these outliers. And so, you know, what we're but what we're doing is is basically it's a way to kind of flag these higher risk patients, if you will, um, or these patients that could have something going on that are either really really complicated patients or they're you know people that have maybe experienced an, an adverse event among this group that you're looking at. And so, at, as it is, it's basically a tool that can help epidemiologists in like a historical look. But the idea is that maybe it could eventually become more of a real-time detection uh, if somebody wants to take it in, in that direction. Sure, that sounds you know, really cool, right? And I think it's, it's great when your research actually helps make the world a better place, you know, in, in, in a way. 100%. So, you know, I, I think that one of the basic questions that I always get from, you know, people who are not from technology or people who are looking to, you know, who are already in technology but want to understand the nuances, what does a data scientist like yourself do? And how is it different from, you know, a data analyst, which, you know, it's another common title that we see out there? Yeah, I mean, it's funny. It, it kind of depends on the company. It depends on, because um, companies have different names for different roles. Um, so if I get, you know, I can't remember exactly, but I think like Google has certain certain names, like they call people engineers or something, and and uh, like data. I can't remember, but they they have every company kind of has. It's just like a title, right? Like I'm a I'm a lead associate, which to you doesn't mean anything, but it means something inside my company. Data science titles can be like that, but I like to, but typically we find that a data scientist is going to be somebody that's doing actual like coding. So you need to either know how to program in, you know, R, Python, Scala, you know, some, some language that allows you to basically take data from a raw state to uh, something that can be plotted or, or certainly the end state, there is going to be a model of some kind, right? A machine learning model. Mm -hmm. um, a data analyst is going to be doing, it doesn't always involve programming, it can, um, but a lot of times a data analyst is going to be somebody that's looking at data that may have already been processed and you're, you might actually just be feeding it into like a dashboard. So tools that they use tend to be things like Tableau or even Excel. Excel can do a lot of really advanced things if you know how to use it, mm -hmm. um, and uh, maybe SAS or SPSS. So, so these are the kinds of tools where, you know, and again, in a lot of these tools, you can still do some programming, but um, typically data analysts are going to be more heavy on like statistics and statistical methods and data visualization techniques, um, as opposed to having to actually, you know, grok this data which may or may not be clean and a lot of like the we always say like 80 to 90 percent of data science is cleaning the data so that you can make a model right mm -hmm. and so um so that's kind of kind of the difference there is the analyst isn't necessarily going to be expected to clean all that data it's going to be a more prepared state mm -hmm. and when you say prepare a model are you also referring to you know kind of the ability to write any algorithms for that or no yeah, it can. Um, but honestly, you know, most problems are solved with a library that we call Scikit-Learn. We don't call it that. That's its name. Um, it's a it's a really common library in uh, Python. R has a couple of other really fantastic uh, uh, libraries in, um, I believe it's ML Tools. And we use those libraries heavily. And you can actually you know, rarely am I writing an algorithm from scratch um, because honestly, there is so much uh, fantastic advanced math and advanced algorithms that uh, will get the job done. Um, the main thing I do in terms of, and I technically, you might be able to call this an algorithm, but you know, sometimes I put models together, right? Like, so you can sort of ensemble them. Um, but in terms of like, you know, am I actually calculating the derivative for this curve? 
no, I mean, it's good that I know how it's done because I'm going to have to explain it and understand what's wrong with it. But, you know, I'm going to use a library to do that most of the time. Mm -hmm. Fascinating, you know, the kind of work that you do. Um, Let's talk a little bit of how you got here, right? Because you mentioned earlier that you started out in academia. You know, tell us about what you did in academia and, and then we can go from there. Sure. Yeah. So um, I actually started out as a music major. Um, so very non-traditional path here. Um, and then I started studying music cognition because I, I've always been interested in the way that music affects people's behavior. And so this kind of led me down um, a path of, of science, basically. And so I, I was introduced to Ed Large, who um, ended up being my grad advisor at the Center for Complex Systems and Brain Sciences at Um, Florida Atlantic University. Um, A great place for neuroscience, a great place for, um, you know, computational neuro, and just an incredible, like, truly interdisciplinary group. Um, And because of that, I learned a lot of different things. I didn't just learn, you know, psychology experiment. I learned programming. I learned visual system. I learned, you know, wet neuro, EEG, fMRI, all these neuroscience techniques and was exposed to like, you know, people who, uh, you know, one of my professors was a physicist and um, it was just, it was really, um, it, it taught me a lot. I got exposed to to coding in a very deep way. And so I, sorry, uh, my screensaver came up. So this led me to, uh, you know, getting my PhD in the complex, in complex systems. Um, I did research on uh, essentially like people and how they entrain to music, how they entrain to a musical pulse, and uh, did a lot of really fun stuff with looking at like the fractal structure of, of, the, of this pulse in music and how people can uh, have the ability to coordinate with it, even if it doesn't sound good to them. A lot of fun stuff there. Yeah, and it, so uh, after that, <laughs> sorry. No, go ahead. After that, I uh, did a postdoctoral fellowship, which is a very common thing to do uh, after your PhD. Um, it's basically like, a, I mean, it's a job, but it's not like a full faculty appointment. It's uh, it's almost like an internship in, in med, like after you do med, med school. Um, and so you... I got a job doing, um, you know, neuroscience with uh, Charles Lim at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. So that's kind of how I got to Maryland. And I did that for about five years. And that was even more fun because we got to look at like creativity in jazz musicians and rappers and looked at the brain signal um, using an MRI, essentially. Um, And so that was really fun. But, uh, you know, sort of that came to its sort of natural end where it was time for me to like get a faculty appointment or start a start my own lab, et cetera. And so I was kind of like, I'm not sure if I want to do that or not and applied for a few positions, but I started looking around at data science. It was becoming, it's, you know, it's like the hot job. And I was looking at it and thinking, gosh, that really kind of sounds like what I, what I already do. I wonder what the difference is. Um, Because basically, you know, all things being the same, I I really loved being a postdoc, and I really loved working in a lab and working, um, mentoring students and and doing the technical stuff and being like, if you will, at the bench, um, which for my field is coding, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I started doing some interviews for data science positions, and I realized that basically it was very similar to what I did, but they used Python instead of MATLAB, and there were some some there was some deep learning that I didn't know much about at the time, and so I found out that there was a boot camp. Um, there were a lot of boot camps at the time, and I looked into one that was um, sort of geared towards people who have uh, graduate degrees um, called Metis M E T I S, which really taught me a lot. It filled in. So I felt like I had this really good foundation of like math and programming, but there were some, at least I felt that I had some gaps and it really, they did a great job of like filling in, you know, the places where I felt like I was weak and, um, you know, basically preparing me to work in the industry. Right. So um, I had never worked outside of academia really. And so it was a great uh, experience and it really whipped me into shape pretty quick and, uh, you know, started uh, essentially reaching out to people on LinkedIn and saying like, hey, what what do you do as a data scientist? And, um, you know, found out that uh, really I liked Booz Allen. I really respected them. I thought that they had a lot of good like 
Kaggle, you know, competitions and, and we're sponsoring things that, that um, were important um, to, to me as like a, as a human in terms of like, they were doing some, some medical challenges about like medical images. And um, so I liked that they were in that space, but I also liked that they were in the government um, sector as well. So they were one of the, the places I ended up applying to. And um, then I took the job. Mm -hmm. You know, so that was, that's a, you know, fascinating journey when we were talking about it the other time as well. So, you know, when you were making that transition from academia and then through the boot camp in Metis, what were some of the challenges you faced? And you talked about, you know, like gaps in skills. Maybe you could share a little bit more about that as well. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the biggest things uh, or one of the biggest changes for me was like this, this, um, so what we call like an agile uh, development. Um, and it's it's actually something you can go and take a course in. That's how one of the ways I learned it was taking a course in it. Um, but it's also pretty simple to, to like pick up once you're on a team that does agile development. And it's this idea of the minimum viable product and having to um, essentially, instead of just building everything in stages, um, you you want to build a little piece of something from front sorry, from beginning to end, right? So you want to build one feature all the way through so that you at least have something at the end of the day instead of being like, well, we built all the back end, but the front end's not ready yet. So we don't have anything to show you. And so it, it it's good because you can show the client or whomever you're building it for, right? You can show them the thing and be like, hey, is this what you wanted? And then they'll be like, no, it's not. And then you can change it before it gets to to be too late. So that's kind of the idea. I'm sure real agile people are like dying right now. Um, but to me, that was that was like a different kind of culture. And so you have there are these like artifacts that come along with agile, which are like stand up meetings and um, these different, like I said, MVP and JIRA tickets. And there's like all these things that like essentially are done in the in the software development world, but it also carries over into like the data science world. And so learning that lingo and learning kind of that, that flow was actually very helpful and very new to me. Cause like, we don't do anything like that in academia at all. And so that, and just the idea of a timeline <laughs> in, in academia, you do it until it's done, right? There's no, like this contract ends on May 1st, right? It's, it's like, well, is it the perfect, the best method you can make it? Is is it published? No, keep going, you know? So, um, I mean, that's that's extreme. It's not true. You do have grants, you have funding, mm -hmm. you have cycles. But as a as a postdoc and as a student, for me, those things didn't play into, into my world that much. And so when you have a job and, you know, you're doing data science specifically, you know, you have timelines, very strict timelines, and you got to have something. And so the idea that like, you know what, maybe this isn't the most perfect model, but it's, I'm doing, I'm getting the thing done. I'm achieving the goal. And so that is a much more, what I like to think of as like, it's a much more engineering mindset, right, than anything. Mm -hmm. And so getting that mindset was actually a really big part of what the boot camp forced you to do because they had us do a series of projects and they were like, this project is due in two weeks. That's it. And so, you you know, you get as far as you can get and you have to present it and then that's it. And that was great experience because that's really what it's like at work. You know, that's really what it's what it's like in, in the wild, as we say. Mm -hmm. Um to be more specific, you know, I didn't have much experience with um, deep learning. I didn't have that much experience with um, the idea of training a model uh, before I got, I went to the boot camp because, you know, for me, I had just, I would just collect data. I would analyze that data. And then whatever I got out of that data was like, that's kind of what we dealt with. And I was never like trying to look at or predict anything in my academic life. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, that's exactly what you're doing with data science. Not only are you trying to build a model, but you're building a model for a purpose, not just to publish a paper, right? Um, very rarely, Shakespeare is the exception, actually. Very rarely am I like building something to publish a paper, right? I'm building something so that somebody can search this, this giant group of documents or so that somebody can calculate a risk score for a patient. Um, and, you know, that's a very different end goal. And so these end goals involve model training. And so learning how to properly train a model, like 
testing why you need to split your data and how you need to split your data and what that means in terms of, you know, how much data do you actually need. Um, cleaning data was not new to me, um, but doing it in Python was, for example. So um, those were kind of some of the gaps that were really helpful to me to, to fill in in terms of like what's different from academia versus data science for me. That's not mm -hmm. everybody's case, of course. Sure, but I'm sure it's a good reference point for, you know, people to, you know, at least get some idea on how you navigated the whole thing, right? So many questions for you, but let's start with, um, you know, I, I remember you also talking about picking up Python in the bootcamp. And the mm -hmm. memory of me, right? So how was that experience like? You know, was it easy since you already had some programming and coding experience? Oh, for sure. Um, having any, you know, and I, I kind of think about this. I always give this advice to people like, I actually, you know, if I'm if I'm looking to, to bring somebody into to my team, you know, I'm not necessarily always looking for someone to have perfect skills in the exact thing that I use every day, right? Um, the thing I'm looking for is for you to have a good foundation in a language. It doesn't have to be Python. And the reason for that is because I know that if you understand one programming language, it will be a lot easier for you to pick up another one. And especially true if you know two languages or if you've worked in one and dabbled in another, then I know that especially a language as friendly as Python, you're not going to have much problem picking it up. And, and that was definitely true for me. When I first learned, MATLAB was my first programming language and it was really hard to come by for me. It was very hard to learn and it was pre YouTube. So, oh. I, you know, I basically learned it from reverse engineering other people's code and asking my, you know, my classmates that were around me um, questions when, you know, and they would sort of, uh, you know, answer my questions. A lot of them had coding backgrounds and coding courses and, and they'd taken courses. Um, if I could do things over, I would have taken those coding courses in grad school because it would have helped me then and it would have helped me now. Um, and it and it doesn't really matter what, what you take. Like, you know, I could have taken it in C and it still would have helped me because like the concepts are there. Um, learning Python, I actually started with Coursera. So back then it was free. Um, and I started with, I think it's out of University of Michigan. They have some really, really good like basics courses. I think there's sort of like three, um, like full courses that you can take and they really break it down. And even if you can't do that, YouTube is such a good resource now. And so that was like a great kickstart. And then actually getting into it and using it on a project is really the trial by fire method of learning a language, but it's a good way to learn it. And it, you get something at the end of it that you can put on a resume and take to me and say, hey, I want a job and check out this other stuff I did and it's public and here's what my code looks like. So, um, you know, those are those are good ways to learn. Mm -hmm. So that brought up another question that I, you know, I thought of. Um, you mentioned about a pet project that really got a lot of people's attention when you, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> do you want to share about that? I thought it was pretty cool. I checked it out on your website. <laughs> Thanks. So I have a website um, and, you know, so this goes back to the boot camp thing, too. So I probably never would have made a website or cold called people on LinkedIn if it hadn't been for the boot camp. Um, a big part of what that boot camp was doing was sort of being like, we're going to actually help. We're not just going to teach you skills, but we're going to help you, like, find a career and, like, make a career for yourself and, like, get you a job, essentially. Um, and so one of the ways they do that is they're like, OK, here's how you network you know, you, you bunch of nerds who don't like to talk to people, you need to talk to people. And uh, sometimes you have to just contact them. And so uh, building a website was another thing that they were like, you should have, a, they were like, we're not going to force you to build a website, but you should do it. And so I was like, okay, this is the push I needed. So I built my website and I put my projects up there and I really didn't, I really got a lot of attention uh, from those that, those projects on the website. Um, it was interesting. I even got like an interview that way. Somebody contacted me um, because they saw my project. So never, you know, underestimate that little, you know, I call it my dog and pony show because it's just a little blog. But, um, you know, I put it on Reddit. I put it a couple places and, you know, people, people noticed. Um, so one of the projects that people noticed <laughs> was this dog cat 
wolf meow classifier, if you will. It's my, my favorite one. Um, because, uh, it takes a little bit of what I used to do and obviously everybody's favorite thing, which is pets and it puts it all together. And, uh, so I was, I had this cat at the time who was really loud. His name was George, very loud cat. And I was thinking about like what I could do for a project that would involve sound and was like, oh, what if I could build a classifier that could classify whether it's a dog or a cat based on the sound that it makes. And so I found a data set on Kaggle. Kaggle is a great place to find free, cleaned data, um, mostly cleaned. This one was. And I found a bunch of basically woofs and meows and purrs and growls that I downloaded and cleaned and and analyzed in a, you know, the way that we analyze auditory data. And I kind of thought of like a new way to do it where instead of just looking at like the full spectrum, I, I binned it um, and that was that was kind of fun and cute and uh, ended up building a, a decent classifier that way and um, using, you know, principal components analysis to kind of help um, help reduce the feature space a little bit because you get this huge feature space with sound. And it's funny because when people looked at my resume when I was trying to get a data science job, the first thing that was crazy, they did. My boot camp also helped me make a resume coming out of academia. My resume was like six pages long it's still it still is my cv still is that long um and i still keep it up to date and it's like it's just a laundry list of like everything you've ever done that's what it's supposed to be and they were like you can't apply to a data science job with this you will it's not gonna happen for you and i was like well, what am i supposed to put on there and they were like you don't need to list all these publications and i was like you don't understand like the publication is my work and they were like you won't, you're not going to need it. It's okay. No one's going to read those. And they are so right. Like nobody cares about my papers. Nobody reads that stuff. And you know what? That's fine with me. Um, but I do have on there like a sentence that says like eight peer reviewed publications, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which was like my whole, it's like 15 years of my life. Right. Um, but the thing that I highlighted were actually the projects that I did at the boot camp and that I had put on my blog and the code I put on GitHub. And so people didn't ask me about, and they were right, right? Like people weren't asking me about like fractal structure of music, right? That's my old stuff. They were asking me like, what about this dog cat classifier? Like, how does that work? What did you do? How, you know, what made you think of that? Mm -hmm. And um, it's kind of funny. And I used to joke, we used to joke with our, among ourselves at boot camp, like, listen, put a map in it or put a dog or a cat in it and you're good to go because like everybody's going to be, interested because of the subject matter and we the joke is that way because it's kind of true and i'm that way too i like stuff with cats so um you know when you're thinking about these little projects you want to do for your public portfolio don't be afraid to play into the the tropes of that because like it's true and you know maybe it'll get you questions when you could do a job interview and and help people remember you also mm -hmm. you know i one of the people i hired had like a kofefe classifier because it was like he had worked on it right after trump had done that tweet yeah. and like it, it stuck it it stuck out to me immediately and i was like tell me about your kofefe and what it did is it actually found the closest coffee shop but like he called it kofefe and i i thought that was great so you know don't be afraid of these little um you know to, to like put your sense of humor or your sense of fun into into your like personal projects especially if you're looking into getting into technology and you just want to showcase your skill set mm -hmm. so um I think the other thing that's, you know, that's also interesting is um, when you were going through that, you know, um, process, you talked a lot about, oh, you know, having to reach out to people on LinkedIn and cold calling in, in a way. Do you have any kind of tips, strategies that, you know, you, you could share with? I do. I do. So what they what they asked us to do was um, essentially what, you know, what they call like an informational interview. Um, and, and essentially, you don't want to call somebody and ask for a job. And, you know, even I don't don't like that, even if I have a, a job that I'm hiring for, just because it's a little bit, I don't know, it's a little bit forward. It puts a lot of pressure on people. And also, they're probably not really allowed to talk to you on LinkedIn anyway, right? Like if they've got a job open, you need to go apply to the job. 
what you want to do is look for people who do what you want to do, especially if or people who work at the company you want to work for. If you know, hopefully you know one of those things. Um, and so, and then just reach out to them on LinkedIn's a great way to professionally reach out to people. It works for me every time. And, and now I try to pay it forward by answering people as much as I can. Um, but you know, you, you reach out and you say, Hey, I'm summer and I have a background in academia. I'm getting, trying to get into data science and I'm really interested in, uh, working for Booz Allen. I saw that you work there and was wondering if you had some time to talk about what you do for them. That's a tricky one, actually. <laughs> You also have to be a little bit careful because when you're dealing with like Booz Allen, for example, or like a government, um, you, you don't want them to think that you're like digging for their secrets. You want to mm -hmm. make it clear that like you're you're wanting to ask about their job as a data scientist and it's because you want to be a data scientist. Do you know what I mean? Like make that mm -hmm. clear. Um, you're not like mining mining for secrets. Um, and people, people will uh, probably more often than not ignore you because not everybody checks LinkedIn, but you know, every 10th one, uh, maybe somebody does uh, contact you back and you say, hey, can I just set up a, a call, a phone call? And maybe, it, and if they, if they will do a video call, that's best because like then your personality can come through. But if you want, if you only want to do a phone call and that makes you more comfortable, go for that. But definitely try to con connect with them like via some sort of voice method is, is my recommendation, not just over email. Because one, it's faster. Like I'm not going to write to you about what I do as a data scientist can take me forever, but mm -hmm. I'll jump on a call with you for 30 minutes, no problem. Mm -hmm. And just ask them what they do and, and how they got into data science. And, you know, they'll probably, and they're used to this. It's weird for, it's awkward for everyone, but like at the same time, everyone's used to it, right? So um, they'll make you feel more comfortable and they'll ask you questions. And if it, you know, you want to seek to build a relationship first. And then sometimes people will say, hey, we might have an opening if they do, right? And, you know, why don't you send me your resume? Or they'll just ask for your resume in general because like maybe they're interested in, you know, looking into to your background and, and what you do and where you're from. So, you know, don't ask them like, hey, could you pass my resume along? Um, that's a that's a personal decision. Um, but I would say seek to build a relationship. And then oftentimes that relationship will evolve into them maybe, uh, you know, helping you or later on, if you've got that relationship and you do apply to a job, you could say, hey, I just applied to X. Do you, would you mind, um, you know, do you know anything about it? Mm -hmm. um, but like I said, that one can get tricky because a lot of times like you're not really allowed to be like circumventing the the recruiting process that the company is going to officially have. So, um, you know, look look for people, try to build relationships and, and find out what they do that's, that's similar to what you want to do. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that because of the pandemic, actually, even I, I personally do a lot of cold calls through LinkedIn. I, I feel that people are actually more open to connecting, you know, especially because of- Oh, is that right? Yeah, that's, that's my general feel of it. Um, so I want to get to this question from Colleen. So for those who have, you know, uh, Colleen Milbury, uh, Summer, I think you know her as well. Um, Hi, Colleen. But, yeah, so, you know, all the uh, fellow female data scientists coming together. Um, so Colleen saying, she's like, I love this interview. And Summer, she wants to know, do you use GitHub or GitLab to showcase your work and skills? Absolutely. Um, I don't use it as much anymore because I use it at work all the time and we have like a work account. And so I, I'm i like pushing and pulling to to the work one so often that I don't pull push and pull to the public one as often. But Shakespeare is actually getting ready to put our code on a public GitHub, which I'm probably going to end up forking and editing through my personal GitHub. So yeah, I think a GitHub is a, is a really important tool. Um, some people use Bitbucket, which is kind of like the mic, is it the Microsoft version? It's just like a different way of, of, of Git. It still uses Git underneath, but it's just a different like connection to collaboration via Git. But yeah, GitHub is, a, is awesome. GitLab is even better and I haven't tried it yet. So um, that's like on my list of things to try. Awesome. And, you know, uh, Colleen was also a guest speaker on our series a couple of months ago. So for those of you who want to, you know, kind of understand data science from her perspective uh, over in the banking industry, definitely check it out. Uh, we'll share the link in, 
you know, our chat later. So Summer, for people who are non-technical, right? They, they don't have, you know, um, the good fortune of going through academia or picking up those coding skills, but they want to explore opportunities in data science. What kind of roles do you think they can consider? You know, at least to make some Absolutely. Entry. Yeah. Absolutely. So there are tons of roles for, for people, even though you may, you may not necessarily be the one training the model, right? So if you have a background in management, right? If you have a background in especially project management, we need good managers, right? Data side, just because, so it's a big, you know, misnomer that like lots of companies make, which is just because you're a good engineer or a good data scientist, does not necessarily mean you're gonna be a good manager of data scientists or a good project manager, even though you have that technical acumen, right? So it's a matter of taking your experience as a manager and a leader, and maybe you learn some of like, you know, you get like a, a high level view of data science. It's not to say you wouldn't learn anything, right? But you would learn like a high level uh, view of the data science, and then maybe you would be able to manage the team or do some of the administrative behind the work scenes that needs to be done for these large projects, because there's often tons of like paperwork and budgeting and, you know, all kinds of roles. Um, another really interesting one that's a very sort of up and coming skill that I see a lot is change management. Um, we we have several people that do this on on our team at, at Booz Allen, and uh, I, you know maybe maybe they could come and, and talk to you as well because uh, uh, some really some really awesome women are actually leading that team right now. And uh, so essentially, what change management is doing is kind of coming in and saying like, okay you have this legacy system, right, this older system that you want to move away from for whatever reason. It's deprecated, it's it's slow, maybe it's not secure anymore, maybe it's not in the cloud, whatever it is, right, this company or this client wants to move away from that and they want to do something newer, they want to upgrade, they want to shift away from this this vendor. And so the change management person would come in and say, well, here's how you do it. And here's, here are your challenges. And here are the things that we, we would recommend that you do. And then depending on the level of involvement, sometimes it is just a matter of like uh, a review and you kind of figure out the, scape, the scope of what people are looking for. But a lot of times what we do is like, again, we sort of get embedded with like the company or the client and we say like, we work with them on that changing, right? So we help the employees learn the new thing and you would help the, the management develop a new structure. And also like when it comes to not just behavior, but also the data itself and the, the code itself, right? So you, you have to figure out where that's gonna live and you have to figure out who's going to own it and how that's going to be secure. And so there's all these things at play. And, and honestly, data is important to every company. So change management around data science or even just data governance or data security is becoming a really important um, business that, you know, doesn't necessarily mean that you write code. It actually means you're going to be writing policy or you're writing, you know, technical papers or you're working with people to, you know, to help uncover those, you know, pain points and places where they need help and then how they're going to get out of that. And so that's kind of an interesting, um, really interesting job that I, I see a lot as well. Mm -hmm. And then for people who are, you know, exploring the idea of being more technical, right, and they're going to take the first step into coding programming, you mentioned Metis, which is the online bootcamp that's a great resource. What other mm -hmm. resources out there do you think they could explore? So um, I mentioned, so the other one I talked about was Coursera, mm -hmm. C-O-U-R-A, and let me, I'll put it in the chat, Coursera. Um, another one is Udemy. Mm -hmm. um, Udemy has really blown up in the last like two years. Um, they used to not have, they used to just have like a few courses, but now they've got like entire tracks of like, you can learn natural language processing from soup to nuts. You can learn Python. You can learn Agile. You can learn all of these things. Um, I don't know that it's free, um, but a, a lot of, like, for example, my company gives us a free subscription. And so, like, we can just go in there and learn whatever we want. It's pretty great. Um, but I think that some of the courses, they have sales a lot. I remember that now. Um, they So, you got to, if you like Udemy, watch for those sales because they'll be, like, 80% off. Um, yeah. 
And so I, before my company bought a subscription, I used to wait for those to be like, oh, sweet, this is $5. I'm going to take it. Um, mm-hmm. And so Udemy can be a great way. Another way is like go to your local university or community college and see if they have some courses because, you know, it's really, especially once you can kind of get started, get some hands on help to get started. It's, I find that the hardest thing is getting started. It's like, how do I install Python? How do I like start to use it? Once you can get started, it's a lot easier to go on your own. But getting getting over that hump of like your first code, your first, you know, IDE or whatever, it can can be really tough. And again, YouTube is also really a great one. There's there's any number of things. It's it's less verified. There can be more sort of like low quality videos, obviously, but um, you'll be able to tell Stanford puts out fantastic material on on data science and math and deep learning and statistics that mm-hmm. I would highly recommend. Uh, so if and that's all free on YouTube. Mm-hmm. Another one is uh, MIT actually has had open courseware for a long time. Like I think that might even predate, it doesn't predate YouTube, but it's it's definitely been out there for since before I think Coursera existed. Um, and all of their coding courses are on there. Uh, mm-hmm. All of their like C, Java, like hardcore, you know, MIT, um, you know, computer science professors teaching, you know, teaching these large labs of people and you can do it for free. Mm-hmm. So on that on that point, um, is there a preferred language, you know, for data science? You know, would you encourage people to do like Python or something else? They have to start I, somewhere. I do right? hate to say, yeah, you do have to start somewhere. I think it's, it kind of depends on what industry you're in. Um, I think that in healthcare, like for example, when I work with like CDC and FDA, um, a lot of people use R. R is a is a very popular language among people who have this any kind of connection to academia. Like R is also popular in academia, Um, but R can also have a little bit of a lower barrier to entry. So that I will say that as well, because R Studio is is a very friendly way to get started. However, if you are looking to build build models that are parts of tools and build deep learning models, right? Which are these like, you run it on a GPU in the cloud and and do these really advanced things, then um, you are gonna have to learn either Python or something you know, even more advanced than Python. Um, but I think if you're starting out, Python's certainly a way to go and pretty much all of my projects are, are in Python. Great, okay. so. We, you know, we are coming up to the time to 3 p.m. And, you know, just want to invite people to send in questions if you have. Um, if not, you know, maybe Summer, you can also share about how do you keep informed about the trends in data science, right? Because, you know, it's always changing, probably new ways to go about it. What are some of the go-tos to you that helps you keep? Trends in data science, that's a good one. So there is like a big conference that happens every year that it's kind of funny because when I was in grad school, it wasn't like that big of a deal, but now it's a very big deal. Uh, It's called NURIPS, which is, um, it used to be called NIPS, but uh, now it's called NURIPS. So, um, and it's essentially where kind of the cutting edge, you know, deep learning models get premiered and it's a very academic conference, but it is where I want, where I get to see like what the latest GPT model is out of, you know, um, the, these companies or, or what Google's latest BERT model is, is going to be that they're releasing. Um, so that's one, but if I'm looking for, uh, which one, the conference? Yeah. NeurIPS. Got it. N e u r i p s. Okay. And so, that's that's a good way to understand it. The other way is, honestly, we do a lot of like brown bags within our company where we'll just have people present like things that they like or things that they're working on, and that's like you know just kind of talking to my colleagues is another big. Obviously, that's not uh, available to everyone, but um, you know that's that's one way that I kind of stay on top of things. Uh, another one is just kind of looking at so again 
this uses data science, I guess, but like my Google news is like curated to give me more of what I click on. And so if you start reading like data science blogs, then like Google will start showing you data science blogs. And um, a popular one is towards data science. Um, and I think that's on Medium, if I'm not mistaken. Um, that's a good one, but it's not like I read every article that comes out. It's more of one where I like, you know, I get like updates, uh, I get like email newsletters sent to me. Um, Twitter is actually another way I kind of stay updated with data science. I follow like some prominent AI um, data science people on there. And uh, that's about it. Yeah, just kind of certain some different blogs that I that I go to but I, I don't know that there's any like one definitive source it's kind of like I just sort of troll around and, and see what people are talking about LinkedIn has a lot of chatter too yeah so uh, before I ask my last question before that can you explain to us what deep learning is because that term keeps coming up but I really don't think a lot of people understand sure. it. so in one minute or okay I'll give you a minute to explain what deep All right. learning is <laughs> Go, go. Okay, so deep learning is basically a artificial neural network. And what makes it deep instead of just a simple artificial neural network is basically that you've got an input and you've got nodes and you've got an output. And essentially all of these nodes in between your input and your output are going to be learning all of the variations and the things that are going on in your data to make class one different from class two, right? So if you're saying whether a cat is in a picture or a cat is not in a picture, it's going to learn all of the things that make those cat pictures different from the not cat pictures. The thing that can be tricky is that we don't we don't really have a way of knowing what exactly it's learning. Is it learning that it has whiskers? We don't know, probably, but we don't know because that's because it is a quote unquote black box. And that's because you have multiple hidden layers in there. Uh, when I explain it to people, I say that it's like teaching, it's essentially like um, teaching a child, right? Uh, when you teach a child a, a language, if they already know one language, then it's easier to teach them a second one. And so models are that way too, which is why a lot of times we take a big model that Google has spent a million dollars training and then we just take off the last couple of layers and we retrain it on our data because it's a lot faster okay that's my one minute spiel okay that's great it would probably take me like more time to digest what you said so uh last call for questions but if not i'm going to wrap up this you know wonderful interview with uh the, the same question I ask every guest on the show. So, Summer, give us one word you would like to leave the audience with today and why? One word would be resilience. And the reason why is because in technology, as in life, uh, you're going to fail and you're going to make mistakes. And, you know, especially as, as women, we tend to put a lot more emphasis on our mistakes than our successes. But um, if you start looking at things as just part of the job and part of coding, especially, then it becomes a, a little more bearable and uh, just helps you kind of remember that, you know, you're, you're going to have a success right around the corner. Awesome. Great. Thank you so much, Summer, for, you know, spending the whole hour with us this afternoon. It was, you know, just so fascinating hearing about the work you do and your background. So thank you again for your time and we wish you all the best in your future projects. And we look forward to seeing, you know, Project Shakespeare um, as well coming out in, in your papers. Um, for attendees, uh, this session with Summer has been recorded and we will share it with you uh, in a post event email blast. So keep a lookout in your inboxes. Um, if you enjoyed the session today, uh, join us for the next one as we speak to Takaho uh, Iwasaki, who is the entrepreneur and founder of Maju Connection, a company that facilitates connections between the tech industries of Japan and Hawaii. We will share that link in our email recap, so keep a lookout as well. And again, thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon, and we will see you in April.